Good morning. Thank you. Uh, glad you're here. Uh, my name is David Jenkins. I'm one of the associate pastors here for those who, who are visiting with us. And uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I don't do this very often up here. And uh, so uh, I, God definitely has a sense of humor because I've often wondered, well, if I ever got the chance to, uh, for, oh gosh, I'm on the screen. <laughs> uh, God has a sense of humor because I've always thought, you know, if I preached, what would I preach? Well, I get the last three chapters of Judges, which is the toilet. <laughs> so, it's that bad, folks. We're not going to read it verse for verse, okay? I'll summarize it for you, and then we'll get to the important stuff of what God wants us to do with this. We've been 12 weeks now through the book of Judges, and, the, and today's the last day, and the people said, Uh, but 12 weeks, what is one thing you were walking away with that God has been saying to you? I hope you'll walk out of here confident of what that one thing is. Um, let me give you a little bit of background just to, as we get started here. Um, Joshua had just, Joshua has died He's led them into the, into, the, into the country. They've begun to take over the lands. And they are going from battle to battle, city to city, taking over things. And Joshua dies. And this is around 1480 B.C., I think it is. There you go. And so between the time of Joshua's death and the anointing and calling of Saul as king, you got about 330 years there. And it's not very good news most of the time. Now, I put Ruth in there because Ruth, the book of Ruth, that takes place during that 330-year period as well. That's the good news. The description and the picture of God's love and passion to redeem and adopt you and me, right in the middle of these 330 years of spiraling down the toilet, is what we, is what we have here. Um, so, Judges starts off relatively on a good note, the first chapter, because they're going in to continue taking more of, of the land. But they're not getting rid of the enemy like God told them to. And so we see this continuous spiraling down to, to just pure disgust by the time you get to chapters 19, 20, and 21 which I get to drag you through today. <laughs> so put on your waders, grab your clothespin, put it on your nose, because we're going to see some stinking thinking here, as Dr. Lamance would say. And it is stinking thinking. It when you sit down and read it yourself, you're going, you go, this is terrible. So we start off in chapter 19, and here's the story. Chapters 19, 20, and 21. A Levite from the area of Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, and he takes on a concubine. Now, a concubine was like another wife, but she didn't have the rights and privileges thereof as the first wife. So it goes on to say that he goes to Bethlehem, finds his, meets this concubine, and takes her as his wife and takes her home. Then it says she was unfaithful, and she goes back to her dad. Now, unfaithful doesn't describe, it doesn't say exactly what it means. We don't know if she was, uh, you know, she had an affair or if she was uh, just having an argument. They just weren't getting along, and she said, irreconcilable differences, I'm going home. And so she goes back to her father. And so after four months passes, the, the Levite comes to Bethlehem to win her back, to get her to come back. Well, the father-in-law sees it. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, my son. Let's have, let's drink, eat, be merry, which is exactly what the scripture says. For five days, they sit there, day after day, making merry. Okay? Merry. 
M-E-R-R-Y. And after about the fifth day, the Levite finally decides, you know, I really need to get back. And the father-in-law again is saying, oh, no, 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 stay, stay, stay. You know, no, got to get going. So the Levite had his servant and two donkeys with him. And so he takes his wife, puts her on the donkey, and they start heading back. That's late afternoon. And they come to the city of Jebus first. Now, Jebus was Jerusalem. It was Jebus back then. And that was one of the first cities that when the Israelites went into the land to conquer, that was one of the first cities that they took over. They defeated the Jebusites and burned the city and left. But they didn't kill everybody. So obviously, many of them came back, rebuilt the city, and they've settled in Jebus. Well, the Levite, being the righteous man that he is, he says, I'm not going to stay in a place with a bunch of foreigners. That was a bunch of Jebusites. They're not Israelites. We're going on. And the servant is going, it's getting dark. We don't need to be out at night. So he says, well, let's go on to uh, Gibeah. So they make their way to Gibeah, the town of Gibeah. Now, that was in the region of Benjamin. And so they walk into the city right about dark, and they're in the town square. And so what happens is you're supposed to, if you live in a city, you're supposed to be hospitable. All through Scripture, God is teaching his people to be hospitable because sometimes you might be entertaining an angel. Well, him and his servant and his concubine, they're sitting there. Nobody is inviting them in, getting dark. And then walks in through the city gate, comes in an old man. He's been working out in the fields, and he comes in. He sees them. Oh, hey, how y'all doing? Where are you from? And he says, Ephraim. Ephraim, that's where I'm from. Come on, y'all can stay with me. So he invites them in. And again, they like making merry for some reason there. So while they're enjoying themselves at the old man's place, 1922 says, as they were making their hearts merry, see, I told you, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house. Now let me stop here and say, you don't read this like you're watching an episode of Downton Abbey. You don't read this like, as they were making merry hearts, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows. No, you don't read it this way. <laughs> this is bad. Another translation says, wicked men. And even our word wicked has a different meaning today, but this was just downright bad, filthy men. Because they surround the house, it says, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man you came into the house, who came into the house, or your house, that we may know him. Now the word know there means to know in a sexual way. They were talking about having sex with this man. I told you it was going to be in the toilet. Now, does this sound familiar? Genesis 19, the angels come into the Sodom. No one takes them in. Then Lot sees them, meets them. He knows who they are. He brings them home. And then the same thing happened here. Only there weren't any angels here. So, they want to do this terrible thing to them. Now, it's, I, I heard one, one Bible teacher say it was probably not just for sexual satisfaction they were wanting to do this, but to humiliate the men, to humiliate the man. Their, their attitude was, we don't take kindly to strangers in our town, so we're going to show him who's boss. It really doesn't matter what the reason was. It, was. it was vile. It was disgusting. It was horrible what they were thinking and wanting to do. So the old man steps out to defend his guest, and he was right to call their actions wicked. But then the old man offers his own daughter I have a virgin daughter. Oh, and we had this man's concubine. And he says, violate them and, and, and whatever seems good to you. But against this man, don't do this outrageous thing. What is this man thinking? 
First, he's this sweet old guy who invites you into his house and have dinner and stay the night. And next thing you know, he's throwing his daughter and this woman out to a mob. But the men wouldn't listen. So the Levite, he, it says he seized his wife, he, uh, his, his concubine. He takes her and he throws her out the door and he closes the door. Then he goes to bed. Folks, there are some people in our, our society that have about that much compassion for someone else. I told you this was the toilet. So he throws her out to the mob, and then this is where you just have to go to the scripture and read it yourself. I'm not going to go in detail, but the end up, she ends up dead. Now you can tell, please, read your kids' Bible stories, but don't read them this one. Okay? Noah and the ark, David and Goliath, you know, Daniel and the lion's den, Rack, Shack, and Benny, baby Jesus, the resurrected king. Read those stories and teach those to your children. But don't read this one to them at bedtime because they'll have a nightmare. This Levite and the old man were just as morally and spiritually corrupt and bankrupt as the people that were outside their door. A Levite was a man of a tribe that was chosen to do special things. They had special responsibilities among all the tribes. They were the worship leaders. They were the ones who made the sacrifices. They were the ones who led people to sing and worship before the Lord. This Levite, just because you're born a Levite doesn't mean you're called of God. Just because you're born in a Christian home doesn't mean you're a child of God. So the next morning, the Levite opens the door and begins to make his way on home. What? But when he opens the door, there she is. And he says, and he says, get up, let's go. But she doesn't move. She's dead. So he picks her up, puts her on one of the donkeys, and he and his servant make their way on to Ephraim. So when he gets to Ephraim, here's what happens. Now he's mad. He wants something to be done about this. Now, my feeling is, as I read this, he wasn't upset of what they did to his wife. He was upset about his reputation and how these men treated him because I'm a Levite. And so what does he do? He sends a message. I like the way Andy Stanley describes this. He sends a message to all the tribal leaders. But he doesn't send a messenger with a letter. He takes the body of his wife, his concubine, cuts her up in 12 pieces, and sends that with a letter. I would not want to have been the messenger. Hey, what are you carrying there? What's in your bag? You really don't want to know. So, he musters up all of this attention. Now, what a true Levite would have done, what a true follower of God would have done was, he would have gone to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was, and where the priest was at that time. And he would have bowed before the Lord, and he would have told the priest what happened, and allowed the priest to go before the Lord to determine what needed to, what needed to happen. But he didn't. He took things... He did what was right in his own eyes. So that leads us to chapter 20. All the leaders receive this gruesome message and they rally together. Something's got to be done about this. So they all gather together at Mizpah, which is close in that Benjamin area. So you have all of these tribes that have come together. Now it says 400,000 warriors. Men with swords, 400,000. Let me put that in perspective for you. How many of you went to AT&T Stadium when we had Harvest America? Full stadium, wasn't it? 90 to 100,000 people. That times four. That's how many people are here. 
And so they decide, well, these men need to be punished. And so what they do is they send a delegate to Gibeah, to the tribe of Benjamin, and say, you men need to find out who these are and, and give them to us so they can be punished. Benjamin says, no, we don't. Not only does the tribe of Benjamin disobey and become rude to their fellow Jews, but they're disobeying God because these men committed a vile crime, a vile sin, and need to be punished. But Benjamin said, no, we're not going to do that. So the result is civil war among God's people. When sin is not exposed or confessed and fellow believers do not step in to correct and help restore that person who has sinned, it pollutes. Right. It pollutes our community and worse yet, it pollutes us. When I did youth ministry, often I would tell, I would tell our youth, you know, somebody would say, oh, so-and-so did this. Did you hear what they did? And I'm going, wait a minute. Wait, yeah, no, well, don't, don't worry about that. And I used to tell youth, I said, there are no secrets in a youth group, okay? There are no secrets in a church. Eventually, they come out. And then I used to also tell them, you need to understand, when you choose, willfully choose to disobey God, your sin doesn't affect just you. It affects your family. It affects your friends. It will affect your church. So the result is civil war. So the 11 tribes have 400,000 men. Benjamin has 20, 26,000. Whoa. But they had another 700 special left-handed guys who are really good with a sling. They had snipers. <laughs> it says... They could hit a hair with a rock. I want him on my side. So they go into battle. Three battles. The first one, the tribes go to Bethel, and we, it gives me the impression they brought the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh to Bethel. And so they're praying to God, who should go in first, Lord? And he says, Judah. Let Judah go in first. So they go to battle. Benjamin comes out, the Benjamin tribe comes out, the 26,000 whoop them. They kill 22,000 of theirs. The 11 tribes retreat. They gather again. This time they're crying before God and asking for direction. Note, this time in their prayer, they refer to the Benjamites as, should we go against our brothers? Whereas the first time they said, should we go up against these men of Benjamin? Now they're realizing these are our brothers. God says, yeah, that's what you're going to do. Go do it. So in the second battle, again, Benjamin beats them, 18,000. They kill 18,000 of theirs. And so this, for a third time, they go back to Bethel and they cry before God. Even this time, they're fasting and they're giving sacrifices. And this time, God assures them, yes you'll have victory. So the outcome of the war was this, chapter 21. The Israelites beat the Benjamites, killing everyone except 600. Those 600 men escaped, and they went to a region called the Rock of Reman. It was a little bit further north of there. Then, after they killed those men and those 600 escaped, they go to Gibeah, and they kill everybody. And then also to the other surrounding towns. They wipe out all but 600 of the tribe of Benjamin. Then, while the Benjamites are hiding in the caves, licking their wounds, the rest of Israel become remorseful and realize we almost wiped out an entire tribe of, of God's people. What, what do we do? What are we supposed to do? So they go before God at Bethel again. 
And here, here's what they said in Judges 21, 3. O Lord, the great God of Israel, why has this happened in Israel that today we, there should be one tribe lacking in Israel? Really? You're asking that question? And then I thought to myself, okay, I'm, I'm guilty because I've made decisions not considering what God wanted. And then when the results are not quite the way I want, I go and ask God, well, why? So this time they make sacrifices, asking God what to do. I've done that. Okay, God, now that I've made a mess, how do I clean it up? But do they wait on God's answer? No. They did what was right in their own eyes. So here was their solution. They said, we've got 600 men over there at the Rock of Reman, and they, they don't have any wives. We killed them all. And we have vowed also not to give our daughters in marriage to them. So what are we going to do? Well, somebody got the great idea. They said, well, who didn't meet with us when we were making our battle plans at Mizpah? Which of, which of our groups didn't meet with us? And somebody said, oh, I know, the guys at Jabesh Gilead. All right. So they send 12,000 of their soldiers to Jabesh Gilead and kill all of them except for any young lady or virgins that they could find that had not been married. So they wipe out another town. Bring back 400 young ladies. And so they send a peace offering, a message to the men at the Rock of Reman, the Benjamites that were left. And they said, please, come. We don't want you to, to, be, to become exiled or to be lost. We don't want to lose one of our own tribes. So those 600 men come, and they give them those 400 women. And everybody's happy except, oh, wait, there's 600 of you, and we only have 400 ladies. So one of the elders comes up with a great idea. He said, hey, there's a festival coming up at Shiloh. Here's what you do, guys. Go hide in the vineyards, and on the day, whenever the, the, all the virgins come out, dancing and celebration and worship to God, run out, grab your woman, and take her home. <laughs> they did. That's what happened. <sighs> God does have a sense of humor, and so does my pastor. <laughs> So we come to the very last two verses of Judges, oh, which says, Judges 21, verses 24 and 25. And the people of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family. And they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. What happened? How did Israel get to this point? The God who rescued them out of Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea, refined them through the wilderness, and took them into the promised land, said this to them. Moses told them in Deuteronomy 7, 6, For you are a people holy to the Lord, you are a people holy to the Lord. The Lord your God. And the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. And then in Judges, moving up to Judges, we're talking... I don't know how many years, at least, Moses, after Moses died, God, notice, God had Moses appoint Joshua to lead the people. And so after Moses died, we're talking a period of about 26 years, 26 years of trying to take over that land that God had promised them. But when Joshua dies, God doesn't tell him to appoint a successor. By this time, the people 
should be knowing the word of God and living according to the word of God. Their elders, their military leaders, everyone should be knowing the, and living by the word of God by that time. But Joshua didn't appoint a successor. And so Joshua 2, 7 and verse 10 also says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And then verse 10, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. But there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. Do you hear what he said? They forgot who they belonged to. They were chosen. They were considered holy. And as one commentary I read says, these final chapters of this book give graphic demonstration of the depravity that, result, that resulted in Israel from the refusal of the people to remember the Lord as king. But they had a king. They just refused him. In Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, we read this. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you. But they have rejected me for being king over them. Now this didn't happen overnight. This didn't happen in a year we're talking 330 years of sliding downhill on this. How old is our country? 1776, 2016, 240 years. Has there been a decline morally and spiritually? This book is for us. They went through the acts of worship. We read that. They went to Bethel. They went to Shiloh. They went to the tabernacle. They went to uh, before the Ark of the Covenant. And they prayed. They even sacrificed. Even fasted. But their hearts didn't belong to him. Their hearts were hard. Not only did they do what was right in their own eyes, but they became blind to their sin and to their one true God. They became blind. They became accustomed to the culture around them. Remember God told them, remove it. Remove the idols. Tear down the altars. Burn them. Kill them. Get rid of them. But they didn't. And as a result, they continued to allow the culture, the foreign culture, to influence their hearts. Sound familiar? But God is so good. We see it, as Eric pointed out, story after story throughout Judges, chapter after chapter, how God was gracious. When they cried out, he would answer. He would send them a leader. But then they would compromise again. His grace and forgiveness over and over again and again. Even if they, even when he sent the prophets later, later we see Samuel and the other prophets and the kings. Not all the kings were good. But the few that were, he honored them because they honored him. He blessed them. But even when there was unbelief and disobedience, he did not allow their disobedience to cancel out his word and his promise. He was determined to raise up his people and send them a savior. And so he sends Jesus. And when Jesus came, he revealed the fullness of God to us in a fresh new revelation. See, because of their blindness and their sin, and just excusing it and doing whatever they thought they should do, 
right in their own eyes. They, they distorted their image of God. We have the perfect word that paints for us the picture of who Christ is and who God is. There are a lot of things in our world and a lot of people in our world who will tell us their idea of God. And as a result, people get a distorted image of who God is. But Jesus came and he was the image of the invisible God. When Jesus prayed to the Father in the garden, he cried, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Abba is an Aramaic word that a Jewish infant says for daddy. You know, we can't, you know, us dads can't wait for our little baby daughter or son going, da, 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 daddy, da, 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 da. Hebrew child goes, Abba, 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 Abba. Daddy. And in the most difficult time, decision of his life, he cries out, Abba, Abba, would you let this cup pass from me? Please, is there another way? But whatever you say, Papa, whatever you say, Dad, that's what I'll do. It was a personal, intimate expression toward his Heavenly Father. Now, hear this. 1 John, but to all, I mean John 1, but to all who receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood nor of the will of man, but of God. Paul writes, In love he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And then he says, Paul writes, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Abba. I know you know all things and you do the best for all of us. Abba. And because you and I are sons and daughter, daughters with Christ, we are fellow heirs. We can call on the, ama the amazing, infinite, almighty, most high creator, Abba, Dad, Papa. And when we begin to see, when I begin to see who I am because of Abba. I'm changed. Abba's love is intimate. Intimate. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given us. And Avi says, lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. And John says, and so we are. 
Abba's love is sacrificial. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much he loved you and me. Abba's love is always. Jeremiah 31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing in all creation shall, se shall separate me from the love of Christ. And Abba's love will change you. His love will change you. Do you remember back in the, maybe back in the 80s when the Iron Curtain had fallen and all of the communist countries were becoming open and they were talking about all the Romanian orphans and the orphanages there? Do you remember that story? How the children were put in a bed, more like a cage, and left, never touched. just fed through the bars of the crib. And as a result, they were developing behind other normal children. But when someone would come and hold them, at first, they were a little frightened, never been touched like that. And then people whose hearts were broken would come and adopt them and begin to hold them. And the child began to change. The love of Abba will change you. Abba loves you just as you are, not as you should be. That means with all of my warts and bad habits, he still loves me. He loves me for who I am, not who I should be. So don't should me. But because he loves me, he will change me. Here's how I know. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The message paraphrase it. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. Are you changing? Is your attitude, your opinions, are they changing? I want you to do something for me. Whatever you have in your hands, just, just set it down. Just set it down. And I want you to look at your hands. Just look at your hands. See those folds, those creases in your hands? Don't look at me, look at your hands. Abba put those there. Your loving Father, He put those there. And you know what? Those folds and creases, they're unique. No one else has the same folds in the same places as you. Just like your fingertips, your fingerprints. No one else has your fingerprints. That's how special you are to him. And you know what? Jesus had them too. The image of the invisible God came to look like us. To show us the Father. To show us Abba. Do you believe God loves you? Do you really believe He loves you? One of my favorite Christian writers, Brennan Manning, said, The most radical demand of Christian faith, this moment in your brokenness, 
with your shallow faith is allowing yourself to be the object of the vast delight of the risen Jesus. Will you be the object of his love? Through Jesus, you and I are invited to address the almighty creator as Abba. In these next few minutes, I want you just to sit quietly. Sit there, look at your hands if you want. But I've asked Brandon to sing a prayer for us. The prayer is simple. Abba, I belong to you. I belong to you. Listen and allow Abba's spirit to speak into the depths of your soul. Don't look around. If you want to look, look at the screen. Just you and him right now. Because he is here. He is sitting right there with you. Closer than your own breath.
closer than the skin on my bones. You right now. What's he impressing on your heart, in your mind? Did you forget? at some point that he was your daddy? Have you chosen to have an attitude different than his? If you have been a believer for a long time, sometimes it's easy to forget, isn't it? Some of us are walking pretty steady, but we've forgotten and we've let go of Abba's hand. Some of us have never known Abba. We've never known the Son of God. He says, come on. Is there something that you've been hiding Something that you just won't let go of and won't let God have it. It's time to do something about it. Because he loves you. Loves you for who you are, not who you should be. And he loves you so much that he's changing you.